it has to have volatility to shake out the the people that that don't belong in the space that the weak hands like we call them Hello and welcome back to the Coin Stories podcast. I'm your host, Natalie Brunel, and we are talking to some of the leading voices in Bitcoin, their backstories, how they were first introduced to Bitcoin, and their take on what the cryptocurrency offers. I'm so excited to share my guest for this episode is the brilliant and mysterious Plan B. Plan B is a Dutch institutional investor who goes by at 100 trillion USD on social and is best known for creating the Bitcoin stock to flow model. If you don't know what that is, it'll be helpful for you to Google it or call it up from the link in the episode notes and have it on your phone or computer while listening to this episode. The model uses Bitcoin's scarcity to quantify and predict its price. Stock is the existing supply of an asset, and flow is the annual rate of production. So how many Bitcoins are in existence versus how many are being generated through mining? Plan B debuted that model in the depths of a Bitcoin bear market a few years ago, and it has been impressively accurate in predicting Bitcoin's price ever since. On the high end, in this halving cycle, Plan B's model forecasts a price between 100000 and 288000 And I know a lot of people are having some fear, uncertainty, doubt about that prediction now, but Plan B says volatility comes with the territory. I'm honored to say here's Plan B. I'm so excited to speak with you, Plan B. And the first place I want to start is really your origin story. What can you share about that? I'm from uh, Holland, uh, Amsterdam. So yeah, I, I'm uh, your typical Dutchman. I'm in my late 40s, uh, and I spent my entire career in traditional finance. So I have a law degree and an economics, quantitative economics degree. Uh, yeah, and, and I was a trader investor for 25 years until I quit recently, and I'm now 24/7 uh, into Bitcoin. And just when you were younger, I mean, were you always interested in mathematics and statistics? Like what, what inspired you to even pursue this? Yes, I, I was always interested in investing in uh, markets, in price dynamics, price discovery. What, what, what this, so what this, uh, does uh, demand and, and supply have to do with price and how this price discovery work in um, auction markets and, and uh, normal markets and, and even... Uh, uh, foreign exchange markets, bond markets, equity markets. It's, it's very different. It's very, very interesting uh, area. And um, yeah, so there is a little bit of mathematics that that and statistics that, that is involved, but not too much. I mean, uh, the guys with an MIT background uh, know a lot more about mathematics than I do. But uh, yeah, investors and especially quantitative investors, they need a little bit of that, a little bit of programming and a little bit of... Uh, well, calling people uh, to know about prices, at companies, about news, facts. and uh, But the mathematics is there too, as well. That's true. And I've always been fascinated with that. Is there something from growing up in Holland that inspired this? Or were, were your parents in this type of work? No, no, no. It was really my, my, um, my own thing. And uh, I don't know what it was. It's uh, I was also interested in astronomy, for example. So the the planets and the stars and stuff, and and how you can um, navigate. I'm I'm a sailor, you know. So oh. it's very interested how you can navigate and and uh, know north from south and uh, a little bit of the uh, coordinates on the on the, on the planet uh, from from the star. So yeah, that that also interested me. And just out of curiosity, is there anything you can share just in terms of social economics and your understanding of money? Um, I'm from Poland. I I grew up here in, in the United States, but I remember, you know, my parents wanted to flee communism and we always kind of had a fundamental understanding of money and the concept of really needing to save and hoping to better ourselves. What was your childhood like in, in Holland with regards to that? Yeah, I think I, I think it was a typical Dutch upbringing and uh the Dutch are always and have always been uh, traders because uh, there's nothing in the land, right? It's very, I yeah. don't know if you've ever been to Holland, but there's no mountains. There's nothing. It's very small. It's it's like two hours drive you're in Germany and yeah. a two hours drive you're in Belgium. So it's 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 really a big city. Um, and there's no oil or gold or anything uh, here. So the only thing that we can do is trade. And, and that we did for centuries. So we're always into trading buying low selling high and uh i think even the stock market when um the dutch set foot in uh 
Manhattan, uh, <laughs> which, which wasn't called at the time Manhattan, of course, but in, in the New York area, when they uh, stepped um, ashore there from their ships, they uh, eventually established the uh, the uh, Wall Street and and stuff uh, in New York, and and that was the stock market was essentially a Dutch invention. So yeah, I think that is very deep into the Dutch culture and also in my upbringing, the trading and uh, saving money, investing, not only working for money, but also let the money work for you. So did you start out right away out of university as a trader? Like what was your early career like? Yeah, so even as a student, I was an investor. Uh, so the, the little money I got uh, went to party and stocks and, okay. and, and, and call options even uh, futures. So yeah, from a very early age, I was involved into the markets. Very small sums of money, of course, but uh, well, if, if you get a feel of it and small um, stacks of money uh, become larger ones and that's how you grow, I think. So yeah, it's uh, from a young age. How did you discover Bitcoin? I think it was it was probably at least six years ago, right, that you first were becoming interested in Bitcoin. How did that first introduction happen? Yeah, so so I have a trading background, but also an investing background. So my last, let's say, 15 years was as an investor, first small bank balances, then life insurance balances, and, and lately more pension fund balances, the, the $100 billion that I mentioned a yes. lot uh, so we manage that with a team, of course, a team of about 10 people. And we're constantly on the outlook for better investments. And uh, most of the investments are very dull. They're government bonds, credits, uh, mortgages, so all the fixed income uh, stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, we have some some other investments, more, more interesting investments as well. And Bitcoin, of course, was a very exotic one. But yeah, it, it, it comes... Uh, on your path, of course, as a, as an investor, and you either dismiss it out hand or you get interested and uh, and and uh, do some research, and that's what I did. So, uh, I guess that's where the mathematical background helps. So I read the newspaper, um, the white paper. I'm sorry, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper in 2013. The price was hundred dollars for a, a Bitcoin at the moment. Um, so I was. Well, at the time I was late, and uh, but the, the white paper hooked me from the start. It was it was so brilliantly written, very simple, very elegant. Only nine pages, including the references, and it yeah, it just hit me. And and from there, there's some references in there. You you, you read other stuff about uh, predecessors of Bitcoin, the hash cash, the proof of work, all the cypherpunks, and. Uh, well, and then you go on Twitter, of course, and, and you get to actually meet some of those people in in in, uh, in virtual reality, of course. But uh, the the community is very open, so most of the people were very open to questions and and pointers towards more stuff, white papers, and and educational videos. Um, so it took me a while, actually. I. I went into the rabbit hole as they call it and and it took me about uh, maybe half a year a year before i was uh, a little bit at ease of putting some money in there but as you know in 2013 the price shut up to a thousand dollars very quickly and well i thought i i'd missed it completely so <laughs> i uh, i did not invest until much later i think it was 2015 my uh, first coins were bought Wow. So obviously, you I, I imagine you started a little bit small and wanted to continue learning about it, right? How did you get inspired to maybe even start creating these charts and really analyzing the stock to flow of Bitcoin? Yeah, so that that's a typical institutional investor thing, I guess. You need to have a fundamental model. So you, you have to go beyond technical analysis, about, uh, beyond the narratives and beyond the, uh, yeah, just the technical uh, stuff that's in the white paper, you have to have a valuation model. And frankly, there wasn't much at the time. There was some time models, there was some statistics, there was a lot of technical analysis, people drawing lines and triangles, but that's not useful in an institutional uh, context. So uh, I knew from commodities markets, gold markets, for example, and silver markets, that 
uh, you know, commodities don't have a cash flow like bonds and equities, so they are very difficult to to evaluate, to value, and um, and the same is true for Bitcoin. So I looked at my friends in the commodity uh, markets and 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 research there, uh, and then I came to the uh, the stock to flow measure because yeah, what why do you buy gold? Why do you buy silver? Because it's scarce. It's not abundant because it would wouldn't be worth anything. So yeah. The, the scarcity is what sticks out. It's also what brought me to buy Bitcoin. There's only 21 millions of uh, Bitcoins out there. There will never be more. There can't be more. And um, the halvings were very um, instrumental in, in reaching that 20 and keeping that 21 million uh, cap. So for me, it was quite clear that scarcity and halvings was one of the areas that that, that was important for for valuing uh, bitcoin and 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 i knew i knew from from um, the commodities market that uh, they use the stock to flow measure so how much gold for example is there out there above the ground and how much is produced every year and if you divide the two the stock divided by the flow then you get a number of 60 years of production above ground for gold and for Bitcoin, that turned out to be 25, I think, at the time. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was very interesting what the halving that we just had last year in yeah. 2020 would bring. And um, I was, what was it, begin 2019 when I developed and published the model. So it was very interesting, sort of a big test if as to, well, whether the model would be uh predicting the, the price right and uh well now we're two years later and it's almost spot on so i'm, I'm yeah still very very much excited it's incredible it's so incredible and i want to talk to you a lot about the the model and kind of simplify the message for people that don't have that kind of statistics background and maybe help uh, break down some of the the points but first i'm just kind of curious what made you decide to you know quit your work and go all full-time into bitcoin bitcoin is something that can really overwhelm you it is so interesting it's it's every stone you you pull up there's there's more inf information and more interesting stuff under it so uh the further the further you go the more people you meet the more interested they become so it becomes overwhelming and and you want to know more so it sucks you in um that's one and and the other things you know what helps is that the price uh goes up uh 200 yeah. every year so if you're in there since 2015 um yeah at a certain moment it doesn't matter how much you invest if, it, if it's like a hundred thousand or a million or something at, at, um, at, at some moment um it's going to add up pretty quickly and then you uh, you have all all other problems and uh yeah. Yeah, it, it it gives you freedom, you know. It's it's also very much associated Bitcoin with the uh, freedom values and and uh, liberty and freedom is is very much associated with it. So yeah, it the two come together. You get the the opportunity to do it, and you have the interest and desire to do it, and then you just go uh, go all in. <laughs> yeah, you're all in, right? <laughs> I am. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, right? You always start with a reasonable amount a uh, not a hundred percent allocation not even 50 or 25 but let's say a 10 percent allocation and then if 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 that goes to, to zero then well no man overboard nothing happens it's all okay but if if that goes uh uh 10x and then another 10x and then another 10x then yeah well it becomes 100% right, of no. your allocation. Well, yeah, no, and I, and I was going to ask because we had that big crash in, I think, 2017, which is when I first got into it. And that shook out a lot of people. I, I assume that probably had a lot of Bitcoins and then just phew, got rid of them. Um, but you weren't shaken out during any of those dips? Well, I had the luck that I sold half at, at, at sort of the peak in the, a little bit after the peak in, in 2000, uh, begin 2018. And I used that half to uh, to buy back in oh, wow. uh, right before I published the model. So it's uh, you know it's it's uh, it was a little luck as well. I yeah. hope to do that one more time <laughs> uh, this time around. Uh, but um, even the big dips don't matter anymore. So you know in the beginning, if if you start investing at the peak in 2017, for example, and then go straight down, that that of course that hurts. Uh, but if if you 
are a little bit longer in the space and have some meat on the bones, some some profits, then well, you get you get used to the minus 10, minus 20, minus 50% moves pretty quickly. That's what I think is so incredible about your model is that we were in the depths of this bear market and you have this paint by numbers model for the price and it's so accurate, which is just, it's so impressive. So for people who aren't maybe familiar with it or they, they've heard of it, but they don't really understand, can you kind of describe how you developed the stock to flow model uh, and obviously the stock to flow cross asset and, and how do you explain it to someone who really has no understanding of, you know, even just, I mean, stock to flow is foreign for some people right the uh, existing supply versus the production yeah and and the first thing you mentioned is very Im interesting uh, the context where i got to the model is is indeed very different than today so it was in the deepest of the bear market we just went down from twenty thousand to uh, what was it th um, three, three and a half thousand yeah. something it was it was really uh yeah very very deep into the into the bear market and Actually, everybody was was talking about going to 1,000, even further. So there were people all, all around me, very negative. The press was negative. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so th those are the exact moments that you want to have a quantitative model, that a, a sort of compass that leads you into the right direction. And, um, and for me, it was it was very clear at that time that my that that. That going further to to thousand dollars was not going to happen. So it, it it was a bold move. With hindsight, I was, I guess, a bit lucky as well that it was <laughs> that period, of course, that I came up with it. But uh, yeah, it was very different. So uh, yeah, the the model is is uh, mathematical, statistical, if you will, but it's also very very simple. And I deliberately made it that way. So. Um, the whole idea is that it, it's the scarcity of something that drives the value. Uh, that's true for real estate. That's true for gold. There is, that's true for Bitcoin. And actually, there is not much. There are not much valuable uh, or, or very scarce valuable things in the world mm -hmm. uh, besides gold and real estate and Bitcoin and silver. There's there's really not that much. Maybe art. Maybe maybe uh, diamonds. But sure. that's it. Yeah. And. Uh, so the second question then is, um, how do you quantify scarcity? How do you measure it? How do you put a number on it? And uh, of course, that's where the idea uh, from the gold market uh, community came to measure it in stock to flow. So there, and stock to flow is, is also very simple. It's, it's how much of an asset is there above ground? Um, that's the stock. And how much is produced every year? And uh, and then you just divide it. So for gold, it's 60. Stock to flow ratio is 60. So there's 60 years of gold production above ground. And that's very, you have to think about that. For example, oil has a stock to flow of uh, a quarter year, 0.25 years, because all the oil is used right away. It's not right. stored. It cannot be stored. It's very difficult to store. There are some strategic military reserves, but um, sure. the oil is is... Uh, used and if if the stock of a uh, thing is is less than the yearly production, then of course the power is all with the producers, and that's what you see with oil. You right. know, the OPEC and all the cartels are very, very have, have a, very par powerful, and um, it it is very difficult. And Seyfried Amus uh, writes about this very eloquently in, in his book. Uh, the Bitcoin standard, which is a must-read. Wonderful, must read for a must-read, yes. A must-read. And uh, uh, yeah, so he writes about how difficult it is for an asset, for a thing to move beyond the stock-to-flow one uh, number. So oil has 0.25. There's also platina, platinum and palladium, for example, which most people think think of as very scarce assets. They are not, actually. They have uh, stock-to-flow ratios of around one or less than one. Because all the platinum and uh, palladium is used in cars, uh, so for for an asset to be hodled, if you will, to be saved and not used in, in the industrial um, uh, things, it it yeah, it has to be seen as sort of money or something. Uh, and that happened, of course, to silver. Right. It happened to gold. It happens to Bitcoin now. It certainly happens to real estate. Because mm -hmm. well, what else do you put your money in yep. these days? These days? Um, and art is, of course, also a very, very interesting uh, 
store of value, as they call it. So, well, that was the second step. Stock to flow was the quantification of uh, scarcity. Uh, very easy, very simple, very easy to measure, not only for Bitcoin over time, but also for other assets. And that's that's where I just, that was the third step, just linked the historical stock to flow of Bitcoin that goes up every halving, especially uh, every four years, it, it doubles. Um, and I linked the stock to flow with the price, uh, just simple. And if if you put that in a chart, with stock to flow on the x-axis and and value or price on the on the y-axis, and do that in a log logarithmic scale. So that's very important. Uh, but it's just a transformation. So if if you put those two numbers in the uh, in a chart, you see this straight line, which is amazing. It's it's just I know I, I saw that chart for the first time. It was like a eureka moment. It was like this can't be true. <laughs> this, 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 oh, I bet because yeah, because that would mean that also for the future, for future halvings, when the stock to flow and the scarcity of Bitcoin would increase, that the price would also increase. And well, that that basically is the model. And and the stock to flow X model, so the cross asset model just adds one dimension, if you will. It doesn't look like, it, it doesn't look at the historical values um, of, of uh, uh, stock to flow ratios and, and Bitcoin prices, but it looks at different assets. So it looks at Bitcoin, silver, gold, diamonds, and real estates. And guess what? They're also on a straight line. And the historical path of Bitcoin and that straight line of the other assets are together one line. So what are the odds? So that was, yeah, what, what I said, it was a one big eureka moment. Of course, there's all sorts of statistical critiques and discussions you could have, but for me, that was that was it. It was a hypothesis that scarcity drives value. It was a test of that hypothesis with data, and it was, well, Gosh, yeah. astonishing to me. Yeah, that must have been such an incredible feeling. And now, I mean, I think people have referred to it as like the darling of models. Obviously, all the Bitcoiners love it because the price prediction is pretty astronomical. Um, but if you don't mind, I want to actually, can I share my screen with you and bring sure. it up on the on the page so that we can kind of talk about it? Because um, just for a couple minutes here, when people look at this, you know, for people that aren't as familiar with Bitcoin, but they really want to learn about it, they want to understand this model. You know, for some people, I think probably just starting out, they're like, well, I see a bunch of colorful dots and I don't know how to read this model. Would you mind just kind of breaking it down? What does this model show? Yeah, so this model uh, is in the first article, the March 2019 article of stock to flow. And it shows on the X axis stock to flow, so scarcity basically. And uh, and it shows on the on the y axis the market value of Bitcoin, so not the price, but the market value. Why the market value? I like the market value better than price because then you can compare it with the other assets like gold and silver. And in this early chart, I put gold and silver in there as a comparison, uh, but there's not it, it's not part of the model. But then you see all the dots, all the colorful dots, the small dots. Those are the monthly close prices of Bitcoin or the market value prices and stock to flow uh, values. So every month corresponds with a uh, dot from um, the lower left to the upper right. So the stock to flow increases and the market value increases as well. And what you immediately see is this straight line and the model is basically the black line that's fitted through these dots. Uh, and the formula is in, in the lower, uh, lower right uh, corner that's that's the formula where you can uh, transform stock to flow to a market value but uh, the color is is actually the third dimension now, that makes it difficult for people i know that but but it's kind of my specialty to put always 3d charts in yeah. there so the color is an extra dimension it's the time until the uh, until the next half so it okay. it counts down from about 40 something months 4 years to zero at the mo at the time of the halving and at the halving for example you see from the lower right uh, lower left bottom to the it, it, the 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 dots the price and the stock to flow goes up and the color goes from orange to yellow to green to blue the blue dot is where the halving the first halving is um 
in November 2012. And then the stock to flow on the X axis, uh, it doubles from about, what is it, four to eight uh, here. And then another four year cycle starts and which basically means the price and the market value goes up. And then that happens again. So it goes from, from uh, red to blue and at the blue, at stock to flow around 10 and the market value around 10 billion, it doubles. Stock to yeah. flow doubles from 10 to 20, or 22, I think it was. And then it goes up again. And this remember, this chart was made in 2019. Amazing. 19, so this was before the halving uh, in May 2020. So the if you would make this chart again, you would have another cluster of dots at uh, stock to flow around 50 between 50 and 60 so it's it's basically working as advertised and going towards that yellow uh, gold dot at stock to flow 62 and around the 10 trillion dollar market cap it's incredible it's, yeah every time i even even if i look at it myself I, uh, it amazes me it is. It's just incredible. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about is, it, you know, if all that matters is the stock to flow, could someone or a government actor just create another coin with, say, a 10 million coin maximum supply? And that could potentially be worth more than Bitcoin? I don't think so. Because um, it's not only the the software, of course, is open source. So you can copy that. You can go to GitHub and you push the clone button and it's uh, you have your coin you you change the name and maybe the 21 million in the some other number and then you're you have your own coin so every go government or every everyone can do that but but you need a lot more with bitcoin that there's what we call network effects you don't need only the the software code you need people to run that code to use that code you need miners to put the security and all the asic chips and their electricity behind it you need exchanges that that um that list those uh that coin and you need of course investors that are willing uh to to invest in that coin and uh and and lots more so we have future markets option markets we have institutional investors in bitcoin now we have merchants visa cards we it and those things those network effects those are the things that you cannot copy even as a government you're just too late so yeah. uh, I wish them all the luck in the yeah. world, but it won't happen. Right. So essentially, because Bitcoin was first and it was so well created, it would be very difficult to to replicate or compete with. Yes. Where in terms of, you know, we've seen a lot of volatility lately. And I think even people who maybe thought I want to get in and they felt a little bit of FOMO and it started to, you know, got to the new all time high, then it dipped lower again. And now people are saying it could go even lower. Um, where does that play in to your price prediction for right now? Yeah, the volatility is high, and and that's how it should be. Uh, I mean, you you don't get twelve years of two hundred percent plus um, returns per year without volatility. If it would go up in a straight line, well, everybody would buy it. Everybody would be a, a millionaire in the short term. So it has to have volatility to shake out the the people that that don't belong in the space. That 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 the weak hands, yeah, like the we call hands. them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the paper hands or the lettuce hands. Lettuce hands. <laughs> <laughs> you need the, you know, hodling is the and especially in a uh, high volatility environment is is very hard to do. It looks easy, but it's not. If if you are able to hodl through a minus twenty or minus thirty dip, which is only one dip, then then you already have won a lot. And if you do that like a whole year, then you're probably in the uh, one percent category that 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 deserves to get this high returns as well. And it's a very, you know, there's Nobel prizes won over this uh, theory that yeah. uh, risk and return are related. There's all sorts of very mathematical models made on it. So for me, it's very logical that with the high returns that, that Bitcoin has, it also has very high volatility and I love it. It's, it's for me, that's a good thing. Volatility <laughs> right. is a great thing. <laughs> Well, you know, I'm kind of curious, and this is something I've actually thought about with regards to your model, the pandemic, none of us predicted that, right? And it sparked this massive amount of printing on a global level. And I think it almost created an environment where it's the perfect value proposition for Bitcoin in terms of 
mass awareness. Like, hey, look at this thing that can't be printed so easily the way that your government is printing money to try to stimulate the economy. This is the perfect time to learn about this technology, to maybe buy in. And so I, you know, I kind of thought that might impact the price, the demand. Have you thought about that at all? Or do you have an opinion on whether the pandemic, if there was no pandemic, would the chart, would we be at the same price? According to your chart, we would, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think the pandemic also set set the, the price back uh, quite a bit, right? The price yeah. of stocks, but also of Bitcoin. But um, no, you're, you're right. The macro environment at the moment with all the printing and the QE and the negative interest rates is perfect. It, and as a matter of fact, let's not forget this was the exact environment that Bitcoin was made for, church, that Satoshi yeah. envisioned. And whether it would be in March uh, to, uh, 2020 because of a COVID virus or earlier or later because something else, that really doesn't matter in the, in the big picture. Um, and there will be more events like COVID that trigger a, uh, well, government that prints money because that's from the ages right the right. romans devalued their their currency they destroyed their empire by uh, debasing their currency and this is the sole reason that bitcoin was made and satoshi was so very clear about this in the uh, first genesis block of bitcoin in uh, january 3rd uh, 2009 there was a message from Satoshi that said, uh, oh, I have to say this correctly, but the uh, chancellor on the brink of second bail out of banks or something. So um, that was that was um, at the height of the global financial crisis when banks, central banks for the first time uh, engaged and deployed in uh, quantitative easing. And, and, and really the white paper that, that Satoshi put out there in October on Halloween. Note, <laughs> note, it was Halloween that he put it out there, October uh, 2008. That was 45 days after the Lehman default. That was when he knew for sure yeah. that the government would step in and yeah. print money until oblivious. So, so it's brilliant. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. This is the perfect thing. I'm kind of curious because Bitcoiners predict that the cryptocurrency will defund gold, but your model says that's wrong, right? Um, it depends. It, it, it's a very interesting question because I have a lot of discussion with gold investors about this. Uh, I don't actually know if the rise of Bitcoin will be at the, at, at the, um, yeah, will, will make gold go down. I don't know if, or, or if they both go up, you know, if you look at quantitative easing, the trillions and trillions that go into the market, it, it uh, increases the value of every asset, stocks, uh, gold, Bitcoin, real estate, everything. Uh, and it's it's more like the dollar is going down and the euro and the yen, of course, but all the fiat currency is going down and all the things that cannot be printed by governments are going up. So I guess there's in fact two factors. There's this QE printing of money effect that puts everything uh, that, that uh, up. And there is the halving effect of Bitcoin maturing. So Bitcoin gets scarcer every four years, and that goes right through that. So I, yeah, I could imagine that um, some gold investors and some real estate investors recognize, bit, recognize Bitcoin as a better investment because it's more portable or more liquid or whatever, and sell their gold, sell, sell their properties and buy Bitcoin. And in, as a matter of fact, I did. I was an old gold bug, uh, <laughs> and I sold all my gold, put that in Bitcoin in 2015, and, oh, and that's well, how the story that started. That was smart. But, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, with hindsight, that, that was smart. But uh, yeah, yeah, I could see more people doing that in the future. Yeah. Um, I think in the end, the interesting thing to look at with gold, for example, is the industrial use. So, for example, silver lost a lot of its stock because it was used in solar panels and electronics, uh, computers and, and everything. So if gold is going to be used more in jewelry, for example, instead of bullion and, and stored in vault, if it gets out of the vaults and melted into jewelry, that would be a bad thing for gold. Yeah. So we, we'll watch that. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, something I always found interesting was um, something Anthony Pompliano, who's also on this series, said that we 
we don't really know how much gold supply there is. We don't truly know inside the earth how much gold there is, but obviously we can make some guesses based on the, the production in terms of scarcity. So I wanted to talk a little bit about your stock to flow versus stock to flow cross asset. Why is there such a difference in the price prediction? Yeah, well, it's a big difference, but it's also not a big difference because it's uh, okay. The, the stock to flow model says a hundred thousand this cycle. So in the next three years, uh, actually this year to uh, to uh, to get the target, and stock to flow X model, the cross asset model says two hundred and eighty eight thousand. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's 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 a um, Big difference, difference to some people, not a big difference to Jeff Bezos. <laughs> yeah, well, it could be a couple of months in uh, in, in in Bitcoin, right? Yeah. Uh, Bitcoin can go up in three x in a couple of months, but it, sure. at least it's the same order of magnitude. It's not like uh, Bitcoin goes to a million or or back to ten thousand or something. Um, so it's it's the same order of magnitude, but the difference is in that respect. I find the difference uh, irrelevant. <laughs> But but I I'm aware that it's a big a big um, band a big interval uh, and a margin margin between it. But uh, yes, stock to flow model is purely made on Bitcoin prices. So the historical is, is based on history. Uh, it's based on it's 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 basically a time series, and there's all sorts of statistical oddities with that. Some some uh, people have mentioned the autocorrelation in the errors of the regression model that I use, and that's not a good thing. Some people have said, well, it can be spurious because everything that goes up is correlated with Bitcoin, which is also going up. Mm-hmm. Um, but so it could be spurious and, and that's still a risk. Um, and that's uh, that's a major disadvantage of, uh, of time series. So the stock to flow X model is in my opinion, the better model because it's not a time series. It it looks at Bitcoin price and stock to flow, but also gold and silver and diamonds and real estate. And it has its own disadvantage, by the way, because there's not much assets with a stock to flow bigger than one. So it's it's really not not a lot of data. And so that's what other critics say. <laughs> okay, stock to flow X, I don't like it because there's not much data. But it doesn't have the same problems that time series uh, models like stock to flow, the original one has. And it has one very, very big um, advantage, in my opinion, and it's that you can interpolate the results instead of extrapolate the stock to flow time series. Because we don't, we, with time, you always have to extrapolate into the space where you don't have um, data. For example, the stock to flow of Bitcoin will be 100 after 2024 halving, but we don't know what the value will be. And we have never, we don't have data of the Bitcoin stock to flow 100 and value at the time. But with the stock to flow X model, there is a stock, uh, uh, an asset in that model that the model is made on, namely uh, real estate that has a stock to flow of 100 and a value of 100 trillion. Mm-hmm. So we can within the range of the data that the model is made on, um, say something about what would be likely, uh, the likely value of Bitcoin when it gets the stock to flow of, of 100. And that interpolation instead of the extrapolation gives me a lot, like like really a lot more confidence in this Dr. Flo X model. And you know, I just want to ask this for the, the folks out there who are going to listen and just say, what is interpolate versus extrapolate? Can you just kind of summarize it? Just very basic. Sure. Uh, yeah. So interpolate is when you make a prediction um, within the data range uh, that is used to make the model. So for stock to flow X, the interpolation, we, we have assets in there with a stock to flow between one and a hundred. So, and a value between what is it? 10 billion and mm-hmm. Uh, 100 trillion. trillion, So everything, every prediction we make between stock to flow one and 100 and value 10 billion to 100 trillion is within the data range. It's it's interpolation. But with extrapolation, you go outside of the model data boundaries. So for example, we have data, historical data of Bitcoin going from 
one cent dollar cent to uh, sixty thousand dollars, and stock to flow below one to fifty six at the moment, but we have no data of Bitcoin stock to flow hundred or values above uh, sixty thousand dollars. So all the prediction that we do outside that data range is extrapolated and therefore more risky. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I want to, this will be a little bit specific, but I know the cross asset model, it looks at real estate, it looks at diamonds. And I'm just kind of curious, how accurate are the inputs for those assets? So like, do you include real estate in all countries? Um, you know, what's, and what's the flow for real estate? Like, for example, how do we create more farmland? Yeah. Um, to be sure, the input is not very specific. So it's very rough. And that is, in fact, true for the entire stock to flow X and stock to flow model. Those are very rough estimates. Uh, and and one always should realize that it's it's just models. They're very rough models at that. And, uh, you know, all models are wrong because they're representations of reality. They're all always wrong by definition, but some are useful like your navigation in your car. Yes. It's it's not the uh, the real <laughs> thing, but it's it's very useful very in getting accurate, you from yeah. A to B. And that's the same with stock to flow. It's very rough. But I always say uh, I'd like to be it's better to be roughly right than exactly wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh so yeah, if we look at real estate, the the one you mentioned, and actually I should have written an article about it and I might do that in the, it's on my to-do list, but it always takes a lot of time. <laughs> I, I do have a lot of more time now. I'm 24 seven in Bitcoin, but it's not out there. And, uh, but I used a study by, what was it? Um, one of the Swiss banks that, that puts this study out there every year. It's, it's a real estate study, the value of real estate globally. Okay. Uh, so every country, uh, I think uh, U.S. real estate market is 30 trillion um, and uh, Europe also about that. And then there's China and Japan and Australia, et cetera, et cetera. So they're okay. all added up. So it's the entire global market. Okay. Uh, and it's it's uh, residential real estate. So I left out the commercial real estate, the, the company, uh, the companies. But um, yeah, and, and then it's, it's well some countries have capital controls like china so you wouldn't go there as an investor because you never get your money out uh, of course the us yeah. is very easy to to invest and in, in europe as well uh, so that that's where i sort of um, uh, did a, a, a small correction i uh, only took the i think uh, japanese us and european markets Okay. Something like that. No, that's so, interesting. Yeah, yeah, and the stock to flow is another thing, but there was a study done um, that was posted on the internet, and I retweeted that about half a year ago, where someone did, uh, actually calculated the stock to flow of the U.S. housing market, and that was about 85, 90 ish, uh, and it was it was a very basic calculation of how much new houses and dwellings uh, there were versus what there was out there. And I did the same thing for my home country, the Netherlands, and for Germany, the information is out there. And they all point to 85. In Europe, it's a little bit higher. It's like 95. So, well, rounded 100 uh, in, in, in the communication. So it's very rough numbers, like you say. Uh, but... Uh, very useful, I but very say. useful. Yeah, no, I was curious because it, with real estate, the flow, I was kind of curious. You know, how do you account for things like improvements, real estate improvements, or you know, when we're printing trillions of dollars to plow into infrastructure? So it's it's difficult to to know. Very, very, and I would like to do the uh, art market one day. So oh, if there's yeah. listeners to this interview that have access to the database of art, I know it's out there. Uh, and it has every art piece, which is, by the way, a two or three trillion dollar market right now. Yeah. It has every Monet, every Van Gogh out there, every Picasso, <laughs> when it was made, when it was last sold, and at what price. And and from there, I'm quite sure I could calculate a stock to flow number because, of course, there's uh, 
um, new artists coming in that database every right. year. Right. Well, I hope someone mm -hmm. accepts that challenge. That'd be very interesting. Yeah. Um, so is your view that the price will essentially never stop rising so long as the technology doesn't fail? And so ultimately the price goes to infinity in terms of US dollars and you know the stock to flow goes to zero? Yeah, that, that, I get that question a lot, of course. Um, and my standard answer is, well, uh, like we talked before, I dare to interpolate until a stock to flow of 100 and a value of 100 trillion. So that would be somewhere before 2028. And after that, it's uncharted territory. So I I really don't know what's what's going on there. And But if, if I would guess, uh, it's not a matter of value of Bitcoin and everything going up after 2028. Because we value the thing in in dollars, right? Mm -hmm. It's and and like we talked before, it's you could also look at it as the dollar going down. So in fact, what I think is going to happen within the next five, six, seven years is that maybe the dollar will be replaced by something else, uh, like a digital currency, that, a central bank digital currency. Yes, and and you see those talks going yep. on right now, right? The, the, yep. the, it could be the SDR yep. uh, that the IMF wants. Uh, the Chinese want more uh, power in 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 and more say in the reserve currency of the world. So, yeah, I think the new Bretton Woods system that every central banker is now talking about is going into that direction, and would probably align with the stock to flow models time frame of uh, 24, 2024, 2028. Yeah, I had a chance to talk a little bit about the digital currencies with Raul Pal, and I'm kind of just curious for you. So, where do you see Bitcoin fitting in if you know governments, central banks are now creating their own digital currencies? Yeah, I think it's a smart thing to do because they bypass uh, the local banks and they bypass the uh, local governments of a lot of, uh, for example, in Europe, uh, and they complain a lot, right? The ECB and 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 is complaining a lot about, hey, we're we're doing all this easing, we're we're printing all this money, yeah. and it all it never goes to the to the public, never goes it never to the goes people directly. All, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and please, governments, do your your part with the fiscal uh, stimulus, mm -hmm. but they never do, of course. Mm -hmm. And now they can just bypass the governments altogether. So I think it's a smart thing to do. And um, you don't think it displaces Bitcoin. Oh no, 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 no! It's it's something completely different because it won't it will not be scarce as Bitcoin, of, as, of course. They That's will right. have control. The central banks will have control of the money supply, and they will make sure they can uh, print as much uh, as they like in 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 times of uh, crisis like COVID or banking crisis or whatever crisis we get in the future. Um, no, so it will be something completely different. It will be fiat, but 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 in a database and and. Of course, it has nothing whatsoever to do with Bitcoin, and I think investors will see that. I mean, it's, I, <laughs> I, if if I would have a thousand dollars in CBDC and a thousand dollars in Bitcoin, and I have to spend some on food or something, I would use the CBDC uh, and 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 keep the Bitcoin, of course, because right. right. that's scarce. Is there a point at which the model predicts the top? No, actually not. No, no. It's a, it's a average levels, and the top will be beyond that. It's it's one of those variables that's because that's not in the model because there is only stock to flow scarcity in the model, but of course there is other factors that uh, impact the price and and greed and fear, uh, greed, um, um, ultimately going towards FOMO. Yeah. Uh, is uh, yeah, it's absolutely in there, but not modeled. So we know right. from history that at the all-time highs, they can go 3x, 5x, even 10x above the stock-to-flow predicted mean values. If the market decides the model is perfectly accurate, so essentially that the price is going to, what, 10 million in 2030, I think, um, then doesn't wouldn't the price immediately go to the net present value of 10 million in, in 2030? Like the market would hyper-ramp the price, hyper-Bitcoinization? Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, that, that's that's one of the best critiques I got on the model very early on, the efficient market hypothesis, basically, that markets, if they have the information and the model is out there for two years right. and they believe it, they would not wait till right. till the 10 million or I whatever. I want the 10 million Bitcoin, now. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, give me now and, and uh, oh, I would make uh, 100x. Um but I guess the fact that that is not happening has to do with that volatility that we talked about. 
So there's um, the stock to flow model that some people believe and others don't. Mm -hmm. But there is also a lot of risk still out there. And one yeah. of the risks, of course, is um, I, I do some polls about what, what are the risks uh, uh, every few months. And the number one is always governments banning Bitcoin, of course, which I think is not a risk at all, but people see that as the biggest risk. Quantum computers also are high up there, uh, which I don't think is a risk at all. Uh, there's, there's also a hacking, of course. Uh, maybe the NSA made Bitcoin. I don't think that's the case, but maybe <laughs> yeah, they, they can take over. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of risk and certainly there's a lot of volatility. You only have to look at the option markets to see that they price in implied volatilities of 80 to 100 percent that's really a lot so i think that's that volatility dampens the uh whatever expectations might be out there based on the stock to flow model or not so no i don't think we will have a front running of the model or super cycle <laughs> if you will because yeah greed and fear because risk because volatility yeah, no, that's why I think it's so important for people to really do the research and educate themselves and read books like the Bitcoin Standard because it does such a good job of talking about really what you mentioned, the simplicity and the security and the transparency of the, the programming, of the technology. Um, and I think Absolutely. a lot of people don't understand that, which is why they feel there is so much risk uh, when really it could, it could save society from so many things that have been happening for decades in terms of value debasement and this income gap, the wealth inequality gap happening. And that's why I think it's so important for people to learn more about this. But um, just out of curiosity, as we wrap up, you made this model, <clears throat> so many people love it and they they really truly believe in it others want to criticize it do you believe in in your model or do you kind of sit there and think oh, like what what did i do that i didn't think of or what what did i not predict what did i not see in this um i know it's a silly question but like do you believe in this model do you believe it will get to some of these prices yeah no it's a good question and uh i i have super confidence in the model to be uh, honest <laughs> I stake yeah I have skin in the game I staked a lot of money on the model uh, not so I'm not only publishing it for whatever reason I, I um, it's a tool for myself to help me invest in in Bitcoin and uh, I am aware that of course I can make mistakes and uh, miss things and there could be better models etc so I would encourage critics encourage discussion and encourage new models. Um, actually, one of the reasons I put it out there was uh, to, to act, yeah, to activate a whole group of quants that I consider myself a quant too, but more quantitatively oriented uh, traditional finance folks um, to think about this Bitcoin, to read the Bitcoin standard, like you said, mm -hmm. and the white paper, and and yeah. do some modeling on on whatever they think needs modeling, and if there's something better. Uh, publish it and and let it be peer reviewed, uh, and I think that's the way the scientific way how it should be. So no, if if there's a flaw in my model, if there's something wrong, please uh, let me know and I come up with a better one. Or, or and I want to be the first to know, right? If <laughs> yeah, I'm wrong, I have to sell. <laughs> so, <laughs> but no. Um, long story short, I, um, I I have great confidence in my model. In fact, I. I would be really, really, really surprised if uh, if this straight line that we saw in the past that we talked about and that is pointing towards gold and real estate, if, if that would bend down, that would really surprise me. Wow. Well, obviously, you're, you're very mysterious. I know you can't reveal your identity, but just out of curiosity, can you just share something um, that nobody knows about you? You can always try, but I have to be very, very careful with these questions. And uh, I think I already put a little bit too much out there. Um, I'm a sailor. Let's let's say okay. that's that's. Uh, so the most chance of meeting me in person, and and by the way, a lot of people meet me in person. You say I'm mysterious. I am on Twitter and internet <laughs> because I like my privacy. But I met a lot of people um, that are at the conference. In real life so uh especially in the investor and and all bitcoin uh bitcoiners area 
So I met a lot of those people in 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 private, and we talk through uh, Zoom calls like we do today. And they know my face, so they know who I am. And why did you want to be anonymous? Privacy. I like my privacy. Um, I, Fair. you know, I am a um, institutional investor, and um, that's a very small group. Uh, everything yeah. we do is under uh, non-disclosure agreements. It's always a lot of money that you work on. The typical deal would be one billion, two billion dollars. It's a lot of money. It attracts the wrong people. Sure. It attracts criminals. It attra attracts scammers. I see a lot of them on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I recognize them from a mile's distance, by the way. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> part of the job. Sure. And I don't want anything to do with that. So Got in it. real life, you can uh, manage that a lot better um, because you just don't meet or you meet in a secure environment or you check people out or something. But on the internet and on Twitter, I think it's just better to uh, to be a little bit cautious, and in real a real life, I can check people out, and uh, I ha I have a security security team that does that for me, <laughs> so it's a lot less risky than on the internet. So that's that's the reason. That's one other reason, by the way, because Satoshi is also anonymous for obvious yes. reasons. Because if he wouldn't have been anonymous, then a government would shut down the project, put him in front of a camera, and and let him say that the project had failed or he would be in jail. But um, there was another reason. One of the reasons is that um, Bitcoin is about don't trust, verify. Right. And in normal life, in real life, you see people, you know people's credentials, and you trust people. And that um, makes you forget or, or uh, uh, that that you have to verify things, yeah. And that is that I find that very very important in investing, especially if you use mathematics and models. I'd rather have the discussion about the models and the facts and the data than about who I am, and and what I did. And uh, I mean, it's serious and it makes a nice story maybe, but it shouldn't be about that. Uh, and and yeah, so I force people to 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 use logic and data and and uh, to to attack me and and uh, that's why i get so angry if people <laughs> try to dox me or or try to uh, find out who i am it i think yeah. it shouldn't it should it doesn't matter who i am at yeah. all yeah no i find the mystery so interesting and fascinating but it does make me think of the question you know how hard is it to be private today obviously you rely on some people who have known you or met you and seen you to also keep that secret for you and it makes me think like how is satoshi still not found out like who he is it's or <laughs> she or group yeah 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 i i think it it the people that know who satoshi is wouldn't tell it yeah. uh for the same reason that um, <laughs> that they're not revealing you <laughs> yeah 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 and institutional investors wouldn't wouldn't disclose anything about about the things they are working on because you only do that once and then you're out of a job because your credibility is is gone. I think it's a bit the same there. If if you know who it is, you keep quiet. And uh, if you do a little bit of digging, it takes you some time. But if you go into the cypherpunks and all the uh, Satoshi stuff, I think you could come up with a short list that, that gets you uh, in the, into the right direction. But, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't. <laughs> So just uh, last takeaways for, you know, anyone who's listening to this, maybe they have a, a bit of a background and they're, they have invested in Bitcoin or maybe someone just coming in. Any just final takeaway that you want people to know or any myth you want to debunk or just any final words? Yeah, maybe that I, I really, really do want to be on a conference one day. Uh, it looks like so much fun to uh, meet all, all the people that I already met uh -huh. <laughs> but, but all together and, and also the, the people that I, I, I didn't met already. But Miami is too early for me, I, I guess, uh, from a uh, security point of view, but also from a uh, COVID uh, travel restriction uh, point of view. So I'm not going to make it. And uh, I just wanted to say how much uh, fun and, and, and joy I wish that everybody has there. And uh Next time I'll be there. Well, we will miss you at Saifedean's carnivore dinner. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Say hi to Saifedean. He's a good friend. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Coin Stories. I'd love to connect with you if you have questions or guest requests, so feel free to get in touch on Twitter at Nat Brunel or Instagram at Natalie Brunel. Take care till next time.